All right, so we're going to get started. Thanks, guys, for coming. Uh, this is Omar, so I can give you some introductions. Hi there. Um, so thank you guys very much for coming, making the trek. Um, everybody who I talked to definitely had a worse commute than me coming to the upstairs. <laughs> so we do appreciate you guys making it over. Um, Dr. Hopkins was going to do our intro for us, um, but we're having some connectivity issues. They can hear us, but I don't think we can hear them right now. Can you, can um, you hear me now? Oh, I, we can hear you just a little bit. Uh, I will turn up my mic. Uh, how are you doing there? We're doing well. Can you guys hear her? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're all good. You can hear a pin drop. Let me see if I can. That's what I'm wondering is if we can. Just go through audio, but it just for some reason doesn't. All right. Or we can, uh, there's a speaker like down there. Dr. Hopkins, if it's okay with you. You can lift the laptop and face the speaker. Sure. I'm going to let you speak, and then I will just repeat what you say for everybody else. Or speak loud. Yes. I never have a problem speaking loud. That's how I started my career. So, uh, and I will speak briefly because we do want to get on to the more exciting part of this meeting. And I want to welcome everybody, whether remote or in person. This is a large group, and hopefully the next one we have will be in person and uh, we're really working uh, on a lot of exciting things. And um, we'll be talking to you as we have often about membership and our new website and content and speakers. And we want to invite everyone who comes to speak like Dr. Sue uh, to become members of the Greater Boston Functional Medicine. Uh, I will let you on an up-to-date I'm meeting tomorrow with a wonderful person in marketing who in one month um, brought my friend's website to 70,000 visits in one month. So he said, everyone's looking for you and that I don't know about you means we have to change that. So we're very excited about the work we're doing and I'll have more updates for everyone. This evening, we are going to be having a timely discussion about uh, COVID, which we've all been living with for two years, and how we implement our treatments, therapies, what's new on the horizon. And uh, I'm so excited to have Dr. Sue here to help us and guide us, and then we'll entertain questions about what he is doing and we'll have discussions about what all of us are doing here, uh, both within the, uh, within the confines of the state of Massachusetts and those of us that work on the national level and have, I'm lucky enough to have a number of state licenses everywhere <laughs> so that we're able to be therapeutic intervention physicians uh, for people around the country. So without further ado, uh, if there's another slide, um, John, do you want to speak a little bit about what's going on at your end for the Greater Boston Functional Medicine? Um, so did you guys all hear, sort of? <laughs> um, so Dr. Hawkins was talking about really with her goals of the Greater Boston Functional Medicine Group, uh, just enhancing practice within, um, within our field and, and growing that. Uh, our speaker today is Dr. Soup, um, who made it all the way here from Newburyport. Yay. Uh, he was telling me that he's been home with his kids for the last week, or his wife's been out of town, so he's definitely a little bit tired. <laughs> um, but the next slide has his bio if you want to. There we and go. Oh, great. Yeah. Well, Dr. Sue, just so you know, I lived on Middle Street, Newburyport. Um, no need to read it. from the grog. Yeah, we'll get started. Yeah. All right. we'll yeah. So if, without ado then, we'll bring Dr. Sue up here. All right. Yeah, yeah. Right up. Joking, uh, yeah, thank you. you guys good with that? Okay. I, I don't know where everybody's at, you know. It's a, mm -hmm. up in Newburyport, like, it's a little, people are a little more like, 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 uh, are good with it. Okay. Um. So, um, nice to see you all. Um, who's, so there's a few people here are kind of new, right? I mean, I recognize some faces. Yeah, I see it. So, but who's, so yeah, Dr. Hans said he's new here. Is anybody else actually first time? Oh, look at that. So I'm assuming somebody here is taking notes. 
Um, I don't know. Yes, it is being recorded. Okay. Yep. We are being recorded. I have this. Right. Well, thanks. Um, well, let's just get started. Let's just get started. We'll just chat our way through here. Um, okay. So just a little brief intro, right, um, on William Wood. Like I said, we could pass the bio part. First of all, I'm just going to tell you right now, um, I'm singing more for my sake. I'm going to talk really fast today um, because it's like the intention here is to be like half presentation of information and half um, just uh, open discussion. So I'm going to talk really fast because I tend to give a lot of information. Um, so be ready. So um, I'll bring you to Indianapolis, 1974. Um, my wife and I met at Cornell. In 19, I started there in 1992. Um, Indiana University for medical school, right? Went back to went back home from medical school in 96. Um, came up to Tufts, which is why I'm up this way, for residency in 2000. Started a job in the North Shore in Rowley, Massachusetts, 2003. Uh, worked a couple of different, um, you know, a couple of different offices as an employee position. Um, and then got introduced to the um, IFM in 2012. Uh, I, just looked up last night. That was the first um, that that big uh, week long intro um, applying practice of yeah, functional medicine course. Yeah, that's 2012, and then um, I led 2014, and then somewhere had the gall to try to start a practice for the first time as a low risk, um, no risk kind of background minded person in 2014, where I'm in my 40s with four kids, don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> um, 2018, for those of you who may have heard of um, ICI, then um, that was uh, that organization was founded around 2018, so I got um, led into that by Peg Tulio, who is a, a dear, dear friend and um, just pay it forward, lovely person and um, nurse practitioner in um, Atkins in New Hampshire. And so um, that was 2018. And then in 2020 is um, what we'll talk about just briefly a little bit today, um, uh, largely in, uh, very much provoked by the pandemic. I went on what I call my search for sanity in the world of functional medicine, like how the heck do you just manage all these crazy conditions and diagnoses? You go to the, you go to the conference at ILADS, you go to the conference at ICI, you go to the conference I'm sure, at ARM, you go to um, A4M, IFM, well, I mean, not so much, maybe not so much IFM, maybe not as much, uh, you, you know these organizations, right? It's like a lot of the same speakers, a lot of the same talks, just like in different emphasis, right? ILADS is much more Lyme, ICI is much more mold, blah, blah, but like you're hearing the same topics, a lot of the same talks, and it's like, okay, like, you come out of that weekend and how do I, where do I start? What, how, what is it, how do I make sense of it all? And then 2022 now um, have started, I won't get into it much, but um, I'm starting a um, second entity um, functional medicine consulting group as a um, virtual practice. So um, here's how um, I, I describe myself as I, I tend to be analytical, sometimes a little over analytical. I tend to be sort of, um, I kind of like keep asking why. So that's what I mean by perfectionist minded. And unfortunately, as I was telling um, Dr. Hand here, I've realized too much since 2014 when I started my own practice, how much I have trouble saying no and how much I tend to be a people pleaser. So so there, brief uh, brief intros on who I, who I am. So I love basketball, as I was just, we were just talking about. I love basketball. I love going to, that's Zion National Park. Um, my oldest kid uh, started going there like six years ago. Or so we've gone every year except the pandemic year. I drink coffee, but I get two cups once a week and each cup lasts me three or four days each. It has, <laughs> it has lasted me five days. And people think I'm really disgusting, but um, which national know. park is that? Uh, that's Zion National Park. Well, Zion. Yeah, Zion. But the colors. Where did you get the colors? Uh, often. <laughs> <laughs> so my wife Jessica, um, she is a researcher at Harvard. Um, I don't. I my background. I don't like um, talking about myself. I'm a very big introvert. I can easily be a fly on the wall in any kind of setting of this sort, or, or even three, four people, even my closest friends. My wife, um, but I will I'll brag about her all day long. She is, um, I would argue, top, top three, maybe top three researchers in the world with the world of metabolomics, if people have heard of that term. Um, in fact, she is um, the president of the International Metabolomics Society, and that's why she's out this week is because they're having their conference um, in Spain right now. Um, lots of interesting stuff that they're doing, including in COVID, so I will refer to her here and there. Uh, oh, sorry, that little um, picture is because she uh, broke her leg, a uh, triple fracture two years ago, um, and it got six surgeries later, and at one point, them telling her, um, a lot of chronic pain, we have one more plan. If it doesn't work, then you're probably talking about finding a way to manage with your quality of life, or if you're in too much pain, then we might need to talk about amputation for aesthetic. And this last April, she's uh, she ran the marathon again, and then if for those of you who are runners, this guy, Zeb, I don't forget how to pronounce his last name, but he's like the last American who won the Boston Marathon, and 
presented her mail at the end. He had like a list of people who were pretty sure who, you know, he was assigned to sort of, you know, find at the end. So really special moment. Here's the youngest kid. Um, he got into Squid Game before we even knew what it was. For those of you who know what that show is, I mean, it was just our older kids were horrified that he'd watched it. We didn't even know what it was. You'd already seen the whole episode. He's gotten into this, uh, the, the meta quest. It used to be called the Eiffel list. So he's kind of walking around like doing that kind of thing, you know, here and there at home now. Here's my um, daughter. She is like the third parent in the family, of course. A lot of you know that about, about daughter. She's a soccer player. She she made that pie by hand, like apple tart by hand, including the crust. She has made chicken pot pie from from scratch, including the crust. And um, adults are like, this is the best chicken pot pie I've ever tasted. And she's watched Grey's Anatomy like three or four times through with the pandemic and her like, mode vocabulary right now is better than I think mine was at the end of medical school. <laughs> Here's my um, oldest son. Um, he was on a quest to prove us that he doesn't need to go to college. Um, he was he was making, I think he was making headway, but now I think he's uh, succumbed to, yeah, I think I'll go to college. Um, and so he's a photographer. He wants to be an action photographer um, as a, as a, livelihood and so there's Zion or there's a national park arches national park in Moab that he took that photo of um, open frame he and his buddy walking around with headlamps and it's open frame and then there's a, a Highland National Park a Highland biking um, uh, park uh, mountain park mountain biking park up in um, New Hampshire if anyone knows that he stitched that photo together of someone doing crazy one in the in the air flip around really I don't even know what you call those things <laughs> There's my um, fun 11 year old. He's a tennis player, which is great. Um, that's what I near and near, dear to me from growing up. And then um, he's got this fun, he still loves this fun uh, koala. We called, he called him Toey. I don't know why. He does have asthma. So I like rubber banded this inhaler Toey one day and had, <laughs> had um, Nathan check him out when he was uh, coming home from school. Toey's like a little, like our pet and family. And then he's, of course, into Legos and Star Wars. So moving on. So have you heard the news of what we are talking about tonight? We are going to be talking about the latest and greatest, the one thing that will turn around your practice and your patients for COVID long haulers. Or maybe not. It doesn't work that way. So sorry to disappoint, but we're going to set our expectations straight tonight. We're not going to have any magic answers. All right. Um, what we are going to talk about today are two things. Um, I'm, going to start, I'm going to start with um, a construct um, of thinking, a framework, um, I, I call it a map, um, of how I, I alluded to, and I'm sure that most or all of us can relate with that conference experience or some, something of that in nature, right? Where, oh my gosh, does everybody have mass cell disorder? Oh my gosh, does everybody have, does everybody have like leaky gut in what way and how do you diagnose and blah, blah, blah. Like, does everybody have, um, I mean, the list can go on and on and on, right? Um, plasma engines, membrane medicine. I mean, like, where do you start? Who, which patients do you look at? You know, if a patient comes to you with whatever, sometimes, you know, whole stack of records. I read this online. I saw this podcast, you know, but wait, wait, we're, no, I thought we were picking up on our last discussion from blah, blah, blah. No, I want to talk about this that I read about. Like, how do you connect those things together? How do you bring them back online? You're walking out at the end of the day and you're just trash, right? You're just trash and you're like, oh God, like, when's my next vacation? How do you make sense of it all, simplify it all somehow? I'm going to tell you what I'm doing. And it's not just, I'm really not into Lone Ranger medicine. All right. I'm not here to tell like this is the latest and greatest or this is the best or anything of that nature. All I can tell you is this was my search for sanity. This is what I came up with. And it has meaningfully, meaningfully changed how I communicate with patients and how I think about things and has been all, all, all for the better. And I've um, had it affirmed uh, validated with many, many. I've not had a single patient who did not walk away with have, you know, you've had those moments with a client or patient where you just feel like you just made a connection. It's like that Geico commercial. We just had a connection, right? You look in their eyes, we just had a connection. And, and you've, you get like jazzed up and it fuels you for the next whatever, a few days, week, month, whatever. I've had so many of those just not because we like came across some magic diagnosis, but only because the communication and we're on the same page we, they understand things in a different way it has been um, so, so enlightening. Um, and then I've had it validated with colleagues and I'll, you know, maybe, maybe games that, maybe not. And then we're going to talk about specifically COVID-19 and long haulers. How does that fit into the framework? And I'm going to actually just zip through the sort of take home points from um, how many familiar with FLCCC? I'm assuming most everybody, uh, so maybe two thirds. Um, Pierre Corey, one of the doctor's names. So he presented at, um, I'm currently, um, 
I didn't mention, so ICI, I mentioned that in 2018. I'm currently the um, vice president for that organization. I really don't know how I got it at that point. Uh, like I said, I really have no business being there, but there I am. Um, Pierre Corey was um, probably the biggest uh, attraction speaker of the conference, uh, the virtual conference we just did like a month ago. And so I pulled his slides and um, just kind of like, I'm going to do the Cliff Notes version of that. Okay, because like, hey, I'm not, I don't have any special tricks for Hope 19. Does anybody else? Um, we'll talk about that at the end, but you know, I'm, I don't have any magic tricks. All right. But what he presented, I would say, um, really reflects the map, reflects the framework that I think through and reflect, um, and, and my, my office staff now think through and more and more colleagues that I've been working with nationally are thinking through. So um, we'll go through that. All right, let's get ready to rumble. So this is what I call, I sometimes I call this map, this framework, matrix medicine, right? Because like, it's not one plus one equals two. It's not one plus two equals three. It's like one plus two plus three plus four plus five equals what, right? There's so many parts to the puzzle. It's so complex. How are you juggling so many things when you're talking to the given patient in front of you, much less you're reading something or you're in a conference? How do you juggle it all together? It's, it's mind boggling. It's, you know, I'm sure many of us have been in conversations with colleagues or with our own selves in our own heads, right? Like, I wish this just would go into AI. Like we need an AI, we need a Watson or something like that, right? Okay, so this is the, I just use this as an example because this I love using this with patients, right? And so my, my kids, like at least used to, I like, went to Imagine Dragons um, concert with my oldest. Um, so the lead singer, the tall guy in the bottom, uh, I love the picture of the job, love the music. Um, he's got ankylosing spondylitis. Does anybody know that? Some of you knew that. Okay, so he, he's out, he's, he's, you know, transparent. I've got ankylosing spondylitis and look, up to date, most everybody knows up to date, right? Check this out, several elements genetic background, gut microbiome, innate uh, lymph, immune system topics, stress at the anatomic structures. Like, if you think about it, this is a multifactorial, multifaceted condition with multiple trigger or uh, pieces that contribute to what manifests as ankylosing spondylitis, okay? So I love that example. Um, so here's what I tell, I'm just gonna tell you what I tell patients. And then we're talking about chronic health patients, right? Chronic conditions. Everyone's got a personalized health map. That map is made up of three parts. It's a three-part equation. And, and that combination is basically like the padlock, all right? Somehow that lock, that, that padlock, it's like your bike lock is, is locked. How do we find the combo of those multiple factors? Is, the, is it a three-digit padlock? Is it a five? Is it a seven? Is it a 12? To be determined, but it's a padlock. And it's probably not even that there's one combo, okay? And, and do the, does the sequence matter? These are all questions I hope you understand the analogy I'm getting at with, with clinical work, right? <laughs> Three-part model, very intuitive. Number one, anything and everything that belongs to you, derives from you, comes from you, that's the self. Number two is the opposite, anything and everything that does not derive from you. Uh, I like to call it the exposome medically, but with patients, I call it the environment, okay? And the third one is the interfaces. This is the regulation of the self and the non-self. The toll booth, the bouncer at the bar, or bouncer at the club, whatever you want to call it, okay? This is because, and so I tell patients, I don't care, right now, there's only one topic in the last week I've now like, mm, maybe that one kind of is an outlier. But I have not yet, since deriving this from my own self a year and a half ago, I've not come across any topic at a conference, even the most esoteric thing that I don't know, I don't, I've never heard about, never made sense of, never heard, you know, exposure to, I've not come across one topic that I can't fit into this framework. And at least from my categorical thinking and learning and assimilation of information can make better sense of and walk out of a conference going, okay, I can kind of compartmentalize that and I'll learn about it more later. And I can, I know how to re re tap into that if I come across that again, or how do I, you know, think about that with a patient. Okay. Um, so let's get into it. Right. What I tell patients is this, um, each part of those three parts of the map, we can characterize to great degrees in conventional medicine mm, to some degree. But when, for those of us who understand, there's a lot more of tools, diagnostic tools outside of conventional medicine. There's a lot of tools to assess and characterize those three parts. So under, under the self, the right side, you got the environment on the left, and these are just kind of arbitrary subcategories, okay? And then the interface in the middle. So let's break it down. Um, I'm sorry, ultimately, the real message is, what is that given person's bug and toxin exposome profile? What does it look like in depth and in, in width, in spectrum? Not all bugs and toxins are equal weight. 
Um, but what does that person's profile look like? And collectively, how much has that bug and toxin profile collectively impacted the self, specifically the immune system? I would prefer to say mitochondria, but for me, it's kind of like one of the same, the mitochondria is on the cellular level, the immune system is kind of like on a, you know, a larger, larger level. Um, I won't say tissue level, but you know what I mean? Um, and the weaker the interface is in the middle, the weaker the toll boost, the weaker the, the, the bouncer at the, at, the at the club, the more the bugs and toxins have faster access and a greater impact on the self, all right? I take no credit for this, all right? I somehow came across this term in the literature somewhere uh, just before the pandemic or around the early pandemic, inflammaging. Is anybody familiar with that term? Okay, because I, I had not heard of that term before. Um, my friend, um, my first boss who now works for uh, Mark Harmon's office, he said, oh, Mark Harmon's like coined that term. He talked about it all the time. I was like, ah, I don't know about that, but nonetheless, fine. Uh, so Mark Harmon talks about it a lot. I never heard it before. Um, inflammation. So you see the three parts, right? So this is more like in the regenerative medicine world. I think uh, my sense of this in the literature is it's more about anti-aging on a cellular level. And as the uh, slide here pulls from that abstract, we're talking about the big thing is here. Chronic, this right there. They define it as chronic, sterile, low-grade inflammation. And there's three parts to it. The non-self, they call pathogens, but let's just call it the right, equivalent of exposomes, the self, and they call it quasi-self. But you see right before quasi-self, they're talking about the gut microbiota. I mean, it's basically the same idea here, okay? Um, I just asked myself, well, okay, they're talking largely about like senescent cells and aging in that regard, but look, what if we take chronic, sterile, low-grade inflammation and ramp that up to chronic, not so sterile, kind of meaningful to high-grade inflammation, all right? That's, this is where the map comes from, really. So when I show patients, I go, look, under the exposome, there's a lot of topics, right? For, I think, I think I would assume everybody here is largely familiar with, if you want to talk about Lyme disease alone, however we want to define Lyme, right? Borrelia, Burgdorferi specifically, all types of Borrelia, co-infections, whatever you want to define it as, how big of a topic is that alone, right? I mean, how long, how long can a patient be stuck treating quote-unquote Lyme disease, right? Months, years, a decade, and they're like waxing and waning, maybe getting better overall, but like they're, they're always stuck, and we're always stuck trying to figure out why they're stuck. How many, I don't know how many of people here are familiar with the topic of not mold per se, so I hate that, I'm just kind of stickler in terms, mold, mycotoxins, mold toxins, but those of you who are familiar with the surviving mold, Richie Shoemaker um, certification, which is what I initially, how I met Peg initially, I was looking into that. Um, oh my God, like that's, how many times do you have to re reiterate that with a patient so they actually start to understand the overall structure, right? And how long does that take to get through that? I mean, years, months, like, it, you know, another mold hit, another mold hit, you know, oh, we're in regression, regression, that you can be stuck in that forever, right? But when you look at the big map, that's just a small piece of the overall big map, right? There's so many other pieces. How many people, we all know, everybody's talking about food reactions, right? In my book, it's largely because, hey, that's something that patients, or we as individuals, we have more control over. It's something we can do something about for ourselves that we don't have to depend on a practitioner about. But look, like, how many people, how many times do you actually, like, have a meaningful, you know, game-changing um, uh, outcome just from identifying one, two, even three foods that they eliminate. I mean, it happens once in a while, but it's not, it's not the game-changing piece, right? In my book, hey, that's not, a, that's not the self. It's not a bug. It's a, at least a potential toxin. We don't like to think about food as a toxin. It's a potential toxin, right? Because it has, it causes reactivity. Same thing with environmental allergens. Hey, no big deal. I'm sneezing. I'm itchy, blah, blah, blah. But it causes immune reactivity, right? It's part of the profile of bugs and toxins that are going to impact your immune system. Okay, so here's the list of like self stuff, and this is not all inclusive. Uh, we can test for all these things. Mitochondria, like what options do we really have for testing mitochondria, right? I mean, from my perspective, sure, we can talk about organic acid testing and stuff, but mm, it's not that great. Membrane medicine is probably more where it's at in my book, and I'm really, I have some connections to talk about that if uh, we probably won't have time tonight, but. Um, autoimmunity, like that's not a good thing, right? But it's a self. It's a dysfunctional part of self. So I list under there. Your interfaces, we all know gut 78%, right? I always tell patients, hey, like, remember, on the average person, there are more bacteria in your colon alone than all the cells in your body combined. That's daunting, right? There, on average, are more bacteria in your colon that do not belong to you than all the stars in the milk you 
You literally have a galaxy of bugs in your colon. You want to talk about the importance of the interface and the barrier, that regulation of the gut. Like, no wonder you've got 70% or 80% of your immune systems lined up against your gut lining. I mean, it's like all the threat is there. It's 24 seven, right? We think about environment. We're thinking about what we breathe, see, smell, you know, touch, whatever, but it's all unseen right inside you. Okay. This is what I call the back nine. I'm not a golfer, but I don't know. It's nine items. It's just fun thing to say. Um, these are topics that I tell patients, hey, this is not like your root bottom line issue within the, the three-part model. This is like second tier root problems, but they often come first in sequencing because you can't treat the root problems without addressing some of these up front, right? So we all know about mast cell disorder, SIBO, very common. Um, I know you guys, talk, I remember the last, uh, I forget, probably what, three years by now ago, yeah. when you guys talked, uh, those, I think those are two of your, two of your, 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 your topics was those two or two of the three, right? I remember the ends, IVIG, mass, um, LDN, and uh, third one. Cypaxin. Thank you, Cypaxin, right. Mm -hmm. Of course, SIBO, right. So, you know, graph on the you know, data, et cetera. So these, of course, these are big topics. Some people's like, they're so sensitive with mass cell, you can't get going without treating that, right? Hyper, HEDS is um, hypermobility, hyperlaxity syndrome. So I won't get into that, but if, um, that's a very, very big topic. I cannot tell you the life-changing impact I've seen with three patients uh two two actually so far but a third one by testing um when they've gone down to back bolognese in new york city and had like crazy crazy fusion in the neck and some people know i'm sure about olympic system right people like you know like in his book toxic like he mandates some patients you've got to go through limbic retraining before i'll treat anything to do with your lyme mold toxic parasites blah 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 right that, that has to come first okay well who do you decide needs that and when etc cetera, etc cetera. well that's all up for grabs but Back nine. And of course, sleep is like, if you got sleep apnea, like, I don't care. We're, you're going to be fatigued regardless. Like, you have to deal with sleep apnea as a, you know, baseline. Okay. So the immune system, it gets stuck, right? This is just a quick, uh, this is why I talk about patients. Yeah, we all know about acute, chronic inflammation, balance in between. Sometimes I'll show them this slide. Look, all this kind of differentiation of white cells. Out of your bone marrows, you get white blood cells, different kinds of white blood cells. You got lymphocytes, lymphocytes make different kinds. You got the T lymphocytes, T lymphocytes break down into different kinds. You got these T helper cells that kind of are the orchestrators of the entire immune system. And most importantly now, we have the Cyrix lab, the lymphocyte, immune, lymphocyte map test, which um, I found to be pretty meaningful. I was really excited at first. It was like a lab I wish we had like three years ago. I was really wishing for it. And then when it came out, I was like, eh, it's a little more expensive than I would have liked. Eh, it's like hemming and hawing. But now that I've used it um, a good number of times, eh, it's pretty powerful. So and for those, just to catch up in case, um, just get us on the same page. So TH1, TH2, TH17, um, there's a lot more THs, okay? But those are the big three. Historically, we thought it was just TH1, TH2. And now there's a whole ton of different um, T helper cell types, profiles based on what kind of cytokines they produce. So the, the base bottom line idea is T, this, this is a checks and balances. That's why I say to patients, it, we have an immune system that's full of checks and balances. TH2 is responsible for keeping TH1 in check. When it's not there or TH1 is overblown, cytokine storm, right? I mean, we've been using that term for years and all of a sudden in the public, it's like pandemic happens all of a sudden, cytokine storm, people are getting hospitalized, vented, you know, dying. And that's tragic, obviously, but all of a sudden cytokine storms like a public, you know, a known public phrase all of a sudden, right? Well, that's TH1 at its, at its worst, okay? So TH2 keeps TH1 in check. TH1 keeps TH17 in check. And TH17 is basically synonymous with autoimmunity. So here's your real breakdown of why we talk about acute chronic inflammation and autoimmunity. In acute inflammation, typically TH1 goes up and then uh, and, and in, balance, in an attempt to balance it out, TH2 will rise to the occasion, try to balance it out, keep TH1 from getting out of, out of, um, out of check. When the problem doesn't go away, the bugs and toxins, right? As I say to patients all the time, we are reservoirs of bugs and toxins. We don't think of it that way, but we are living reservoirs. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. We have to have those bugs, those bacteria in our colon for all kinds of purposes, right? So it's a symbiotic, it's many times symbiotic, but many times not. I, I, I don't know, I like to think of the illustration of, because um, my kid, Star Wars, Mos Eisley Cantina and the original Star Wars, right? You got people in there that are good guys, right? Luke Skywalker, Ben Kenobi, r 2 et etc. You got bad guys, Greedo's in there to kill Han Solo. And then you got some sus characters, as my kids like to call it, right? You don't know what's going on. They're a little fringy. They look a little bit suspect. You're not really sure. And yeah, some of them, they come out and they're going to pull a gun or pull a fight or whatever. You got the immune system's job is like figure out who's a friendly, who's a foe, who's neutral. We can just let you hang around. But um, 
when the, when the problems don't go away and TH1 burns out and does not give the signal to TH2 that the party's over, we're packing up, you guys can go home too, TH2 stays elevated and now TH1 goes further down. So now TH1 is burned out and it's being suppressed by TH2. Now you don't have the break on TH17 and then autoimmunity develops, right? A lot of this stuff is like Alessio Fasano, who's the uh, GI researcher at um, Mass General, you know, basically put leaky gut on the map. Um, uh, researching the cholera vaccine and that I don't think ever happened um, in 1999, 2000. Funny story, like to give an idea of pointing at my wife here. So I'm getting ready to go to the iPhone conference. I think it was 2017, 18 on autoimmunity. I don't, my wife's telling me as I'm leaving the house, like, where are you going? What's conference again? And then she's looking it up on, on her phone. She's like, oh, that, that keynote speaker, the first person, Alessio Fasano, I've got grants with him. I was like, I don't even know who the guy is. I don't even know his name. She's like, yeah, tell him I said hi. Oh, the second person, that's that. He, she works with him too. I have a grant with her too. Don't know who I am. Tell him I said hi. All right, fine. I mean, that's, that's, we live on these opposite ends of the world. She's like all in the research world. I'm all in the clinical world. There's, as we all know, the in between is like a void, mm -hmm. but um, it's fascinating the kind of stuff that she and I talk about sometimes. So uh, we all know about autoimmunity, right? I tell people, like, like, if you watch TV at all and you pay attention to commercials, like the percentage of commercials that are about biologics is what, two thirds, three quarter of the commercials now? I mean, at least. <laughs> Everything's an autoimmune problem, migraines even, right? On some level, or sometimes. So let's shift gears. That's the map. Um, shift gears, and I'm reminding myself I gotta talk a little faster here. Um, here's Dr. Pierre Corey's talk, all right? So I apologize, I can't, I don't feel right um, allowing the slides to go through to, uh, for sharing because I've, I wasn't able to reach him, but he's a, he's a very collegial guy, very, uh, he came across as very humble to me. Um, you know, I, I didn't moderate his session and talk to him directly, but nonetheless, this is his talk, all right? Select slides with summary. So this is now specifically to do with COVID-19. His talk was on long haulers and post-vaccine injuries, kind of uh, not totally synonymous, but we'll get into that. So there's a, first of all, there's a difference between hospital versus outpatient uh, long haulers, right? Much more acute, much more respiratory based when you're talking about hospitalized patients. The outpatients um, more commonly, the symptoms are starting weeks after, sometimes feeling fine in between, um, and it's milder, not as necessarily respiratory based. I, that kind of rang true with me. A lot of patients we have who are either suspect or known are very, very like clinically diagnosed as COVID long haulers. Their shortness of breath is not seemingly a major issue. A few, but not not major. Um, so he, this is a slide he was talking about um, in the context of vaccine injury, but I would strongly believe. Um, in totality of the talk that he would say that this uh, applies to the post infection as well. Look at, so here we are, multiple intersecting and overlapping pathophysiologic processes, right? Again, multifaceted matrix medicine. It's not a single one entity. It's not just people with MCAS. It's not just people who have had Lyme or multitoxins or whatever you want to say in the background. We don't know the whole combo. What's the padlock? We don't know. Okay. But if we structure out for ourselves a construct, a framework, it's at least, for me, it just keeps me sane. And all, even more so when I'm talking to the patient, they can follow what I'm thinking about, okay? And now, now the trust is like a whole nother level. And when they read stuff, they can put that in a better framework. And now we can have more meaningful engagement conversations subsequent to that, that um, meaningful uh, discussion. So. So uh, these are these are all the, the side pieces are just my little um, inputs, right? I've got a little couple of linings, highlights, and I've put in little things just to say, hey, where do these pieces fall into the map? So overlapping effects, persistent inflammation. Obviously, everybody knows about that, about that. Autoimmunity, yeah, clotting cascade. I think everybody knows about that. Hypercoagulation there, right? Viral reactivation. Some, I think we've all talked about that, right? There's, um, uh, I talk about that all the time with patients now, like. Uh, chronic or recurrent reactivated mono was always this like taboo thing for years and years and years. And now in the context of COVID, it's talked about like it's just secondhand nature, like everybody accepts that, right? Like, okay, thanks for, you know, a little slap to the face or whatever. But um, mast cell, of course, everybody knows about that too. So you see, right? Self immune system, self autoimmunity, back nine hypercoagulation, exposed home issues with viruses, but this is like persistent um, viruses that are in our bodies as a reservoir, mast cells, back nine topic. So I can like go through a slide and go through a presentation and go, okay, that's how that fits and that how th that's how that fits. What topics might I, might I might have to deal with up front as a back nine topic before I can address the actual root causes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, again, mononuclear cell activation. All right, so this, these slides are kind of more just fleshing out the, um, the summary slide there. So he goes into thrombogenic um, clotting cascade activation. Sure, large clots, micro clots. I think everyone's familiar with that kind of stuff, I'm assuming. 
uh, activation of dorm dormant viruses. Yeah, we I think we're all familiar with that stuff with the monotopic, especially. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know about you guys, but we've had um, I think three patients in our practice who have had like shingles in their eye that the optometrists or ophthalmologists are now saying, yeah, we're seeing this more with COVID. Mm -hmm. So that's become a question now. There, we've had one or two patients where the ophthalmologist, optometrist, whoever must have been an ophthalmologist said we actually want you to take you know Valtrex or uh, what, whatever equivalent like indefinitely. And we're like, wow, just for that one time episode. Um, mast cell activation. All right, we know about that. Again. Yeah. Ultimately, immune dysregulation, right? For me, if I look at that whole map, if I'm given any given patient as a new patient and I can only do one test to start assessing where they're at, what's their current status and where to look next, it's the immune system. Now, what does that look like? If it's a conventional testing, that's one thing. If I can do the Cyrex lymphocyte map too, even better. But it's the immune system. That's for me, like if a person's got immune deficiency, Right, we've got a lot of patients doing the IVIG also, right? And when we talk to like Hyzentra or whoever the uh, whoever the uh, insurance companies are, or whatever, or the, um, the in between players, and they're always like, "Hey, your patients are going to be on this forever." And we're like, "No, no, no, no. These patients, they're like currently temporarily immune deficient with an IgG deficiency or whatever, right? But we're not assuming this is going to be long term. We see that go away, and then they come back and go, "Wait, wait, huh? Like, yeah, yeah that's you know, when you look, you find out that's not always the case. Um, so." If I see immune deficiency, and I'm not saying this is the truth, right? I don't have data to back this up, but I'm telling the patient, the way I think of that in the map is you have enough bugs and toxins. And look, if, you're, if you tell me, I've been sick so many times since I was a kid, I was on antibiotics so many times, I had all these infections, I had, I've had meningitis or meningitis scare, I've had pneumonia two times, I've been in the ER for IV antibiotics X number of times, that's another story. But that's really, really rare for me, right? Most people are like, I never had a health problem until I was 35 or whatever, right? And I'm now 53. And so I'm going... I don't have clinical evidence to say you've got primary immunodeficiency from birth. So I'm assuming there's a good chance you have what I'd call secondary immunodeficiency. Mm -hmm. That's reflecting for me, you've been loaded with bugs and toxins. Mm -hmm. It's impacting you, even if you don't have like meaningful clinical symptoms say, well, I'm not on antibiotics twice, three times a year for sinus infections, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, it doesn't have to be the classic infections, you know, Lyme, Moltox, whatever. It could be like chemical POPs, whatever, but your immune system has been impact enough that I'm seeing evidence of immunodeficiency, whether I'm looking at the IgG uh, subclasses, the IgA subclasses, um, and I, I cannot tell you, I mean, it's not a ton, okay, but it's just, it's so alarming, the number of patients I've seen, what, you know, because we do a hybrid primary care and consulting in our practice. So I've got patients who I, I just routinely offer the, um, the immune test testing, just, do you want to know what your immune system looks like? I've never had a person say no, all right, so I, I can look at the, IG, uh, the subclasses, I look at the, um, the lymphocyte sub subset. It's subset number one in Quest. It's on um, the T cells and natural killer cell panel for LabCorp. I've had like a handful of patients who they're never sick, quote unquote, they're not on antibiotics, but they are like IgG subclass, whatever deficient, they're IgA subclass, whatever deficient, and they've had low CD3 or CD9, uh, CD4 or CD8 or all the above. I mean, it's, it's crazy. And I'm like, how did you get to where you are? You're 72. How did you get to where you are? I don't know, but we're concerned about you. I'm concerned about you going forward. Okay. So uh, again, intersection number of factors, you got genetics, the self, you got exposome, the mRNA load, sure. You got um, estrogens into the hormones. Um, that's self again, back nine nutrition status. Uh, so this is where a therapeutic approach for Dr. Corey, there's a core protocol he talks about. Um, and then he's got second and third line category uh, therapies. We're not going to go into great detail here because none of it's like a magic answer. Um, he, he said that himself and would say that recurrently. It's like everyone's different. Okay, must be individualized. So a lot of the stuff we're all familiar with, right? Intermittent, intermittent fasting, ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine. We're, we're familiar with that. So vitamin C, yeah, we all know about that. I, I circled low dose nitroxone just for, I mean, Johnson didn't ask me to, you know, highlight anything, but there you go. Because it's a nice segue. Omar steps out like right in bad timing because he's going to talk about LDN. Um, you know, I think I'm sure everybody's familiar with the question. Obviously, probiotics like no-brainer, omega-3 fatty acids, sure. You know, we know about the um, anticoagulants um, or you know, blood thinners, etc. Um, so again, but here, like previously, I didn't. The other slides I didn't mention. You know, I didn't see anything like with the gut. But look at that. It's, it, he just states it as an obvious. Vaccine injured patients classically have a severe dysbiosis. So he just puts it like hey, this is like common and classic. All right. Well, obviously, there's a gut interface issue. And then you got patients. I got a patient who's going to tell me. Look, how many times do you have a patient that you want to go digging into gut health issues and they're going, I don't have problems. I poop at least 
at least every other day, yeah. even every day. Some patients like three every three times every two days. I don't have a problem. I don't have bloating. I don't have I don't have heartburn. Why do you want to deal with my gut? All of a sudden now, when you point to the when I point to the map and I go, look, you've got immune deficiency. It's going to be worse when your interfaces are bad. You can have gut health issues and not know it. It's under the hood, right? People have high blood pressure all the time and they don't have any symptoms. Yeah. It's it, and all of a sudden the light bulb is kind of different. And all of a sudden, ah, that makes sense, right? So you want to do like a stool test, you know, whatever, or you want to you know look into it or do X, Y, and Z. All of a sudden, it's a different ball game of discussion. Second line therapies, all right. So you know, I'm I'm assuming most of us have come across the fluoxamine discussion. Sure, um, mitochondrial. XYZ, NAC, everyone knows about, sure, steroids. Um, yeah. Yeah. Third line. So this is, I, I highlight HBOT because he was really big, really, really big on HBOT. That's one of the take-homes I'll throw out right now as a, um, as a sort of cliff, cliff notes. Uh, he was very big on HBOT. In fact, he was, um, I remember him saying, yeah, you know, I talked about it with my colleagues going, wow, this like, it's helpful enough that we should just invest in HBOT. So I get a bunch and start, you know, having our patients use it because we're, we're using it so much. He says, well, yeah, but as a conventionally trained guy and, you know, not used to this kind of um, integrative world, you know, he's an intensivist, right? So, but his practice is now almost exclusively uh, virtual consultations for post-vaccine and uh, long haulers. And so, um, and now he's like introduced into the um, functional and integrative and less conventional medicine world. And he's like, yeah, I'm just not, I'm not comfortable with prescribing somebody to do something that we're, you know, making money on. So, but that's how big a deal was for him, right? He thought about it. Trimple and anticoagulation. I cannot speak to the Maraviric, uh, or however you spell it, I pronounce it. Um, I know he spoke about it, and it's kind of like, uh, plus or minus. Um, I don't, oh, so I just left it up here just to give you, uh, you know, awareness of what he was talking about. Brain fog, again, uh, he mentions LDN is a big deal. Again, I'm just teeing, I'm just setting up the T for Johnson's there. Um, so here's, here's where we're at. The, the, uh, the cliff notes treatment highlights really were he was big, big, big on HBOT and then um, hypercoagulation. He was, it, it wasn't so evident on the slides I just showed, but he was very big on talking about that, you know, fatigue, um, coagulation in the muscles, coagulation in the brain, brain fog, et cetera, et cetera. Mast cells he was big on. And then, of course, the big thing that was kind of like this nebulous topic was what's the underlying comorbidity profile, right? So um, how many of you with uh, Mary Ackerley? Uh, as some people call her the neuroquant queen, right? So she's one of the co-founders co of ICI. So, you know, she, um, uh, and so she's on our board, of course, as well. She's uh, past president. And, um, you know, that's, in fact, I think at, uh, I don't remember if it was a board meeting or it was a mini conference of some sort, but, you know, she, she re, 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 uh, capitulated that, re, re summarized that. Is that the right word, capitulate? I uh, resummarized that saying, yeah, so Dr. Corey, you know, talking about um, long haulers, it's based like HBOT and yeah, figuring out what their, she didn't say map, but basically that's what she was saying, like you know, who has what the underlying problems are and, and how do you address those underlying issues to basically reduce inflammation, reduce chronic inflammation, what, however you want to define that. Mm -hmm. And I'm defining it as what does your map look like? What are the exposome players? What is your, do you have an immune deficiency? Do you have a, an interface deficiency, right? And so that's a, this like big, uh, black hole box, but um, all of a sudden I'm saying, nah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, lot of more. For me, I like to have an organizational structure. I don't like to just, uh, I, I don't know, it's, it's that sort of um, why questioning kind of thing in me that I, I just, I'm just not comfortable just shotgunning everything. I, I'd like to have some kind of, some kind of rationale of what I'm doing. So again, the translational proposals to me are hypercoagulation. So, so here's the thing, right? Anytime I come across those back nine topics, I'm asking why, because those are not, th there's a reason for them. Almost always there's got to, there's in all likelihood, in the majority of those cases, there's a reason for it. That is an underlying further root problem that falls within that three-part map. So if, if someone's got hypercoagulation, I mean, I, I had the hospital calling us every day about, you got another critical D-dimer, you got another critical D-dimer. And like my, my staff's like, oh my God, like, do we need some for a DVT? No, no, it's not a DVT. You know, they've had COVID or, you know, blah, blah, or, hey, these people just had it. We didn't even know it, right? How many people are walking around with the Heidi Diamond don't know it? It seems like it's quite a bit. Um, so if someone's got hypercoagulation, then I'm going back and saying, look, the immune system is not just about defense. It's defense and repair. When you've got hypercoagulation, it reflects to me, your immune system is ramped up because it's trying to repair something. What is that something? What's the cause? Now we dig back into going working backwards. What's your exposome profile? Do you have interface deficiencies, et cetera? Same thing with mast cells, right? Do people just born with mast cells? I don't know, maybe, but the majority of times, right? In the, in this, in the Schumacher, uh, the Richard Schumacher um, protocol and 
you know, this is Mary Ackerley's world right there with Neuroquan. One of the big reasons she loves Mer Neuroquan and, and teaches people about it is that the cerebellum, the thalamus, when they're, when they're enlarged on the Neuroquan, you can bank your money on someone you think, you halfly suspect they've got mold toxins. You can bank your money. They've got, um, you know, uh, SIRS by Richard Shoemaker topic, or I like to call it um, SIMS or SIMIs for chronic inflammatory mold and mycotoxin condition because it's, it's a semantics thing again, right? Mold, mold illness, yeah, mold mycotoxin. Um, so, you know, that's, that's the world. It's like, if you've got um, mast cell activation syndrome based on the thalamus and cerebellum, okay, why? In that case, in that world, it's, it's because you got mold toxins. Well, not always, it's, it's a collection of stuff. So now we can talk about, do you wanna do the dig? As I'm talking to the patient, do you wanna do the dig? Because it's not gonna be simple, all right? And it might be even costly with tests, but when I talk it out and show them that, yeah, there's people who it's a cost issue, but it's very rare someone goes, I can't take this, turn it off. You know, I, let me just be, just treat the symptom. Like that doesn't happen. All of a sudden it's at least, oh, right? And it's at least, how about we negotiate and how about we do this testing and that's not normal, then let's go into the next steps. And as a year later, I'm having the same conversations and I'm going, Remember when we talked about that map? Let me quickly review again what that means. Like three-part map and blah, blah, blah. And we talked about this before and we did that digging, but we didn't do this digging. We don't have your full map. So do you want to dig further now? Because your symptoms are ongoing. Yeah, let's do that digging now, right? Um, okay, um, that's it. Uh, I probably, I didn't pay attention to my time. I apologize. I probably went past the 30 minutes. I'm sure Omar's, uh, in fact, he is already, I'm so late, he's, he's left. <laughs> I was starting late too, so I'll, I'll, that's not all my responsibility. But, uh, I know you guys want to, uh, I think um, John's want to talk a little bit about um, whether it's LDN or other um, updates. You can do that now. We can tag on and go around to COVID, whatever you guys want to do. Uh, it's up to you if you want to go into COVID or see if you have questions uh, or if you have case. Do you want to do the LDN? Sure. Yeah, yeah well, let's talk about LDN and then we'll, the intention is really just to discuss like what are you guys seeing and doing with COVID with the uh, long haulers and vaccine injury and learn from each other. Sure. I think most people here have used LDN in the past. Mm -hmm. um, so everyone knows sort of how it works or you know how to use it uh, so we were just going to go over just the different things that we do and different strengths uh, obviously 1.5 to 6 is sort of a standard uh, 4.5 is still the go-to dosing uh, nighttime dosing is still the best obviously if you get the uh, crazy dreams or trouble sleeping you could change it to daytime dosing and then switch back to nighttime dosing uh, after a month and that usually helps the patients regulate it and they don't have those same issues uh, we are doing a lot more, we're seeing a lot more as liquid, liquid preparations as well, uh, just so people get titrate easier. And a lot of the patients that fail, we're seeing a lot of them go back to 0.5 and then work up slowly. So if you're seeing patients that have issues with it, um, especially if they're going through, you know, different things with mold or other issues as well, uh, with COVID, you can start them lower uh, and then just go up slow. So if they fail, try to restart them, which we're seeing again, still a smaller amount of people. Um, and then just glutathione is one of the other big things that we're seeing with COVID. Uh, glutathione inhaled, so we do an, uh, the inhaled nebule cap uh, for people that are having lung issues or uh, trouble breathing, issues with lung tissue, otherwise oral dosing from the supplement companies or transdermal weak compound. Uh, so that's the two things that we are seeing the most of. Uh, so I just opened it up to see if anyone else has uh, questions on other therapies that can be compounded. Uh, otherwise, I think it's more case reports or just try to see if people are having uh, interesting patients that uh, they need help with from each other. Uh, we'll leave John, a we do have a couple of chat questions as well. Yep, go ahead, Dr. Hopkins. Yep, just I uh, put on the chat. You know, I know we talk about using LDN at night. Is there a pharmacologic reason for that? Uh, it, so it does work better when the body's at rest. Uh, so if patients can't tolerate it, it's fine to do daytime dosing, uh, but it does work better at night. And it actually will help with sleep once people get regulated on it. I don't know if you guys see that at all in your practices, but it does, it does uh, work better at night. And sometimes people that are using it for pain, offices that are using it for pain will do... Uh, a half dose twice a day if you're having those issues where the patients are having uh, pain for pain treatments. So 
it's still pulse therapy. It's still in the body for four to six hours. So it pulses in the morning and at night. But again, most people are still doing once a day dosing. And then obviously higher dosing for psychological issues, more like a six to 12 milligram dosing. Okay. Different conditions, obviously. I did want to, I wanted to bring up one study in science where they looked at 146 patients with long COVID. And what was interesting, they did uh, all of the right testing as far as CD57, C3A, C4A, uh, complement values, D-dimer, et cetera. And they really did the full panel. And what was interesting is the common thread uh, or actually the only finding of the study for long COVID was anxiety. Now, did COVID precipitate anxiety? Did anxiety precipitate COVID, long COVID? And we have, you know, reached across the aisle on this discussion from the 70s when fibromyalgia became a diagnosis and then Lyme, then chronic Lyme, chronic Epstein-Barr virus, and I think we need to come up with a clinical, scientific, and a community-based response to it's just all anxiety. And I do not think that is the case. I think that people have a culmination of exposures and then uh, debilitating symptoms. And who would not reach the point of anxiety dealing with all of these However, what was interesting is that the data really points to dealing with the neurologic mental status, the sleep, and how do we, and Dr. Sue, I, I welcome your, your thoughts on this, which is really making the person whole within the aspect of peace in their life. Uh, so how you can make people feel whole or at peace with less anxiety. Did I get that right? Uh, sure. You know, because we're dealing with people where we're the only, you know, in 146 patients clearly followed with long COVID, anxiety was the overwhelming uh, symptom, not a CD57, not their IgG, you know, all of the things that we look to as sort of hard facts, but rather this soft uh, presentation of their ability to handle being sick for a long time. And how do we deal with that? How do we encompass that and not, and not as you said, this should be no shaming in that, but rather this is the outcome of how you suffered through this. And as you said, many times a culmination of mold, Epstein Bar, you know, so many uh, viruses, long term infections, and and how these people are handling it. Any thoughts on what you we I know what we're doing, just wondering what you're doing. Yeah. Does anyone have any good suggestions for that? Obviously, sleep, I think, plays the biggest role, but any, um, anyone doing I mean, uh, There are a couple things that I do. One, you know, even though this is a new disease, it's not like we haven't seen virus problems before, and so we're not, like, totally shooting in the dark. We have a sense of doing things, because I think part of the anxiety is, is that no one knows what's happening, and no one knows I'm going to get it better, you know, and so, like, reassuring the other thing is is that um when you don't have enough oxygen the body should give you a warning sign that you can't breathe and for some people that's anxiety and so like part of you feeling something's not right is part of you understanding that something's not right and we're going to address that and so once they realize okay once my body starts to feel better, I'm going to feel better. Then that's useful because you can go in both directions. You know, anxiety can cause shortness of breath, but shortness of breath can cause anxiety. And so I think that when people tie into, okay, this is my body talking to me as opposed to I'm going crazy, that's helpful in calming people down. Sue? 
So, John, um, maybe talk a little bit about the uh, supplements in ashwagandha, L-theanine, you know, tonics that calm the mind and how we may incorporate those into our approach. Is anyone using any adaptogenic herbs to, to do that or any formulations that people are recommending? Well, that, that was my question. Like if, you know, cause I mean, that's, that's in a non COVID world. I think um, if, if anxiety comes up, that's, that's a common, you know, easy, uh, first, first step. Right. So I'm curious when people are using what are your usual, whatever you usually use in that realm that you just referenced, how many on a rough scale, what percentage do you feel like people are benefiting in the same way as non COVID related topics or is it a different response? So the adaptogens and how to educate the, the patient. Basically, it's going to take time. It's a month, it's going to take a couple of weeks. And this is a little bit different. You have to start them all slow because you don't know what's up. So there's a lot of companies that have combinations of adaptogens because I use them. I use them all the time. But you have to know the patient. You have to look, see where they are at. Start slowly. You can start with five HTP. Start with something very simple with small doses the other day. Wrenches that will take the edge off. So it's it's all about education, and knowing what to do. So yes, they do. They do. They're very helpful in any situation, any anxiety situation. So you're finding that um, COVID, uh, like COVID long hauler type patients, are responding in a similar fashion to you previous months. Start off slow. We start off slow, especially with the range of So instead of doing a large dose all at once, starting those kind of down would go taper off. So it's, 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 it's everything's different. So, so adaptogenic to, blends, 5 yeah, HTP. It just depends. If you're giving too slow much, you don't know. Someone may not be, you know, they may, they may not do well with um, ashwanda, but they're fine with the pain. You know, it's so you have to, that's why I like to take it individually. Yeah, so I'm not sure if the can the group hear that on Dr. Hopkins. Can you hear that clearly? It's here. You know, if you have a portable mic that you can hand people, if the volume was a little bit louder, we could hear the discussion, which would be great. Or if anyone wants it, they can always come up or just scream louder. But 5 HTP seems to be a good one uh, and multiple times a day for dosing. We've brought in low energy neurofeedback, and I'd be interested in anyone who feels comfortable lens using the lens. We've been doing it now since January. I'm getting my feet wet, uh, but I'd be thrilled to hear about anyone else. And we also do the brain tap. And Leslie could probably speak on that, the brain tap or the lens. Or I think what Dr. Hobbs is asking is, is anybody really using any type of energy therapies? I know we were talking a little bit at dinner about using cold laser. So cold laser therapy is something, uh, we bought a laser about three years ago, and we found it incredibly effective and very quickly works for patients who have long haul respiratory symptoms, who get short of breath with, you know, minimal exertion. That really within six to eight sessions, we get dramatic improvement in their lung function by um, lasering their anterior apices and their lung points, their acupuncture points, and their posterior lower lobes, and a few other parts. So I think she's just asking if anybody's doing any other type of or energy type medicine. We have low energy neural feedback, we have cold laser, and now we're just getting our feet wet with uh, frequency specific microcurrents. So I don't know if anybody else has anything to add to that. <laughs> we are. We, we, we do some advanced. Do you want to come up and speak so we can oh, hear? Boy, can I do well? <laughs> Just so we can hear and everybody oh, okay. who's, uh, everybody who's uh, on oh, Zoom God. can hear. So, um, Go for it. <laughs> this way or that way? Either way. Okay. So, uh, we're using some bio. Um, 
it's called biofields, but it's bioresonance. And there's energy programs that can, um, if you have low energy, it's a way of testing. You have to be trained how to do it, et cetera. So um, we will be offering that in our practice. We just opened up a practice in Norwood, uh, as well as um, cryotherapy, um, um, saunas, and uh, hyperbaric chamber. So we are actually, uh, we would deal quite a bit with uh, athletes, boxers, and um, uh, MMA, and, and so a lot of injuries, and, and, and it heals. So that should help with the anxiety. It has so far, Lyme disease, a uh, whole bunch of different disease states. So, so it's very effective. It's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it's bioresonance, so it's, it's, it's food allergies, everything, everything we're talking about is biomedical, uh, the bio, everything, so it's just been, so a lot of learning, but it's, uh, it's working. Yeah, I think um, having heard about the mitochondrial and uh, sort of implementing its, uh, increasing its function and uh, so forth, but we've been also, uh, and um, <clears throat> we haven't had yet much experience with patients. Uh, however, I can say personally, seems to have added uh, a little bit more respiratory function uh, and as well. Um, it, does, it is a bit cumbersome in the sense that it requires at this point, uh, at least in a pharmaceutical recommendation uh, used and the infusion has to occur at a low, low rate uh, at least one of these two, two or three hour period time. So that in of itself it can be a bit cumbersome for patients. I know it's definitely cumbersome for me because the sense of three hours is uh, a lot fast. Um, but um, there are alternative, uh, I've heard from uh, other individuals that utilize it as well, that they've been getting by with using it um, uh, sub-Q, or sub-Q injections on a daily basis. Uh, they came up with a particular dose, I think it was trial and error. And uh, so, you know, sort of another avenue for regards to uh, homework and letter and so forth, enhancing. Uh, one other thing that sort of uh, add in addition to that, uh, I guess uh, if I could do a gunshot approach of sort of things swiftly, I guess the one that's not working, throwing something else, and continue to act with. Uh, I mean, trained in the past where you know, it was more of a sniper approach, but I think with what I just heard in this lecture, with all these um, multiple variables and variants and so forth, maybe the sniper approach isn't going to be what's practical anymore. Uh, and that's the stem cells. And it's so interesting. All those great things that I think became more of interest uh, during the pandemic. In fact, I know for a fact it became more interest, of interest during the pandemic. Because I was an individual who uh, actually, I uh, feel to this very day, survived uh, the flood. And, um, uh, you know, that, that would take another several hours to uh, talk about variations with the way uh, patients are recommended, whether it's uh, uh, amniotic uh, versus uh, now there's a process of utilizing adipose tissue and processing it to stem cells. Uh, a lot of that work has been done internationally. Uh, fortunate to have a colleague uh, who uh, was able to have the time to go to all these various countries and explore the different processes and so forth that they come up with uh, and the end result are uh, Millions of uh, stem cells, uh, and I think that's done because uh, it's, it's a, you know, a little cheaper way of doing it, as opposed to relying on the, uh, processing it through amniotic fluid. Uh, and uh, that, that, at the end of the day, it becomes uh, quite an expense with regards to purchasing it and adding that uh, purchase price to the patient. Um, so yeah, no, I think this uh, era that we're in. Uh, seems to require a lot more advanced thinking. Uh, it's uh, of note that uh, when I say advanced thinking, a lot of countries have done this for a good number of years. And uh, again, I think the stimulus of the pandemic 
looked into what other countries were doing, what success rates they had, and uh, it's fascinating. You know that all sort of comes down to uh, not healthy type of things that uh, you know we fight on sort of in the past. So very entertaining lecture. I enjoyed it tremendously, and uh, I think the challenge amongst all of us is um, sort of putting it all together and seeing what sort of protocol may be of usefulness to your patients. And I'll take one particular protocol if it's um, individual. It's going to be a challenge to kind of figure out, you know, what do you use and when to use it, how often you use it, and so forth and so on. So, oh, that's good. Anyone else doing anything um, unique? Or just what are you doing? It doesn't have to be groundbreaking. What do you think helps? Uh, one of the other so, things, too, just on the LDN side is uh, anxiety. If you are getting uh, patients that have anxiety already, you may want to start LDN at a lower dosing because some patients are seeing more anxiety with LDN if you start too high. Just threw it out there because I was thinking. So what do you consider low dosing, like one milligram? 0.5, and then go up to slow, uh, 5.5, up to standard dose. But we're, we're getting more anxiety type side effects from the COVID patients. You mentioned uh, six to 12 milligrams for psychological issues. What psychological issues? Um, whether it's uh, like impulsive, like eating or um, just other types of like OCD type symptoms. Syndromes. And would you start them at a, at a low dose and ramp, ramp up to six? Yeah, or? even those is like 1.5 to 4.5 is still good. It just seems like those patients need higher dosing, whether it's a six milligram twice a day or just a nine or 12 milligram dose. And how do you know that they need more? Um, well, if you're if you're using it for a specific condition, you just go up to that dose or see how it works at the lower dose. So if it works at the lower dose, that's great. But it seems like most docs that are trying it or using it for those conditions just automatically start at a six or a nine. So it just depends on the patient, I guess. Did you say it's used for OCD? OCD type things, yeah. So whether it's eating, yeah, which is like contrary, it has it added. Um, that's part of that drug. So that one's, I think, already added 12 milligrams. Can you tell us about the liquid form of LDN? So liquid form, same concept. It's, I think it's a five milligram per ml and you can just dose, dose up. And again, obviously capsules are always easier for people, but if you know you have a sensitive patient or they're already loaded with other conditions and you want to start slow, either start with a 0.5 capsule or a liquid. How do you price this? Uh, good question. I can get back to you on pricing. Uh, I think it's similar to mm -hmm. the capsule dosing. It just depends on the volume. But um, Chris can reach out and just get back to you on it. I think she was asking U.S. currency versus crypto. Yeah, oh, crypto <laughs> only. <crypto. laughs> uh, if it was crypto, I'd be in trouble. Not good today. Not good today. <laughs> For chicken eggs. Yeah. <laughs> Question on LDN. So, if you were to, if um, if there was a if there was a hypothetical ideal marker tests to assess who would most benefit from LDN. Does something come to mind what that would look like for me? Uh, and it, just looking at the inflammation markers maybe and see, I mean, I guess it just depends what you're using it for, what, what patient population. Uh, so then maybe on based on that, would you say if someone's, if someone's just got uh, more, uh, again, more based on, um, Test based here as opposed to symptom based. All right. So if they if they if they just have a lot of abnormal inflammatory markers, let's say they're they've got an M three M three nine over five hundred, they've got a TGF beta one that's um, I don't know it's called fifty five hundred plus. They've got a um, they've got an elevated D dimer. Um, they've got fatty liver, right? That maybe mild hyperglycemia, et cetera. Then you're expecting that person's going to benefit more than someone who's got say like half or third of those. I think it should be in drinking water. <laughs> um, so it's tough. Um, 
obviously the liver one's the only issue anyways because of the drug itself but i i think any inflammatory markers or any any conditions that we're seeing it being used for we're seeing positive results so it's it's an i just call when i talk to patients on it, i say it's a neat drug because it's just so unique and everyone that tries it i'd say 90 percent of the chunk the time it works well for what they're using it for and if you like, I'll, I'll look at profiles when patients call because obviously they get different compounds. So if I look in their profile and see that they were on LDN and they stopped it, I always ask, you know, are you still on it? Because they may, they may be getting it from someone else or uh, they may have just stopped. And when they stop, I usually ask why you stopped. What was the, the reason? And a lot of it is, you know, some docs will throw them right on 4.5 and they just don't feel good. And they can't tell you what they don't feel good. They can't explain that I don't feel good. It's just they don't feel themselves. And it, when they restart it, they still have the same conditions and nothing's helping. I usually say, you know, why don't you check back with the doc, maybe start a lower dose. And those patients that have started a lower dose have done fine on it after that. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's really interesting. And I mean, everything from um, arthritis now, I mean, a lot of the rheumatologists are using it. Um, SIBO. Yeah, SIBO. Kinetic. We're seeing uh, a lot with the gut and a lot of um, just regulating mm -hmm. stool and just changing that. Um, I mean, I'll talk to patients about, you know, what's your stool like when they started for arthritis. And, you know, if they're not normal, usually the next time I talk to them, their bowels are regulated. So it's really, it's just really interesting. I'm not sure if I've seen that one or have patients on it because obviously as the pharmacist said we don't always see the conditions unless we unless we ask and i haven't seen that one and what mechanism of action of the drug do you think like are the, are the key points for us to understand that gives it this kind of wide effect i think a lot of it is just the way it works in the gut and i think a lot of that translates to how it works on the immune system uh, but i think that's a presentation in itself and omar would be great at giving that one uh, so he had to step out. So he's a lot better at, uh, at speaking on these things. But I think a lot of it is uh, the gut, how it works in the gut and how it works on the, um, the gut tissue. Are there any questions that yes, now, yes. people want to ask of the group in terms of uh, working with COVID patients or just in general? We really wanted to set aside some time for people to just freely speak and um, ask any questions that they have. I have a question about the inhaled um, glutathione. Because yep. um, I have a patient who has long COVID and she was diagnosed with COVID in uh, fall of 2020. And since then, had to step away from her job. Uh, she has shortness of breath just even speaking. Really, that's really hard for everybody. She's been seen by uh, lots of long COVID clinics and really having kind of a hard time um, getting back to normal function. Um, and I'm just wondering about this might be a good option. She actually has good relief with the hyperbaric chamber, but only temporarily. Um, not for if there's up for another. Um, so I was just wondering about the inhale and how that would be prescribed. Yeah, and the laser sounds like it could be a good one too. The laser would be very good. I'm just curious about that economy. Yeah, we haven't taken outside referrals. It's up to Dr. Hopkins, but okay. um, I don't, I'll give you my contact okay. information. Yeah. But um, that's one of the things with the long haul COVID that we have seen that has the most dramatic effects is it most quickly. Long, long, is it something that sticks? Is that the thing? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And they do, we do 30 minute sessions okay. with the cold laser. Okay. And um, generally, after the first session, they feel better they're not recovered but like okay yeah. I, i'm feeling a little bit better and so we try to get them to do twice a week okay. for four to six weeks okay. and commit to doing it in a row because there is a cumulative effect mm -hmm. and then for the glutathione obviously you can uh, we do it as an injectable to do injectable you can do the oral as a liposomal capsule you want to make sure it's liposomal or liposomal liquid uh, or transdermal uh, and then for the in, in health, we do it as a nebulizing capsule. So you would uh, dose it out, 
in whatever dose, whether it's 100 to 300, okay. and then they open it up, mix it with saline, and then uh, use it for standardizing the dose. So you have Lufthan injectable, not IV? Not IV, it's an IM. Yep. So how much IM is that? I think it's a 100 milligram. I think it's a 200 per one, so it's a 0.5 dose, so 100 milligram dose. 0.5, so the so injectable volume would be how much? 100 milligrams per 0.5. 0.5, okay. so can you do more than that? I, you could, so if they wanted to do, I think the way we have it, it just happens to be 0.5 because of the way we do our testing on it. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we can in 0.5, 0.5 ml is 100. Yeah. And then the inhaled, we obviously have just more doses because we make it. So it's either 100, 200, or 3 is our standard. And they can do that once or twice a day. Yeah, and our patients that we first started with on that were like COP patients, were the ones that we're seeing the most to try to get the glutathione in the lung tissue, and then COVID in. So I think just sort of as like a natural progression for the provider. Mm -hmm. So I was going to say, with the long, uh, the long haulers, the functional neurology clinic that I'm a part of, we oftentimes find that the lower brainstem has been affected in, in certain different regions. Many of those patients also get, you know, some level of dysautonomia or they, they want POTS. Mm -hmm. So we'll often work with them on a tilt table or uh, we're also making sure that the vestibular and vestibular ocular systems are intact, mm -hmm. as well as doing a you know, cool laser um, um, as well. And you call laser the brainstem? We can, uh, yeah, there's certain protocols that go along with the Oconia laser that we have, because it does have the, the violet and the red and red light. And so there's certain protocols that we can go through to work through. There's different settings for brain stimulation right. for sure. But we can also do, you know, the bedside treatments for uh, long haulers as well. And feel free to, too, for the providers that are doing cold laser, feel free to make sure to say it in the mic so everyone knows who they could reach out to. Sure. Yeah. And I think some people have lasers or can you can buy the lasers too. So you can figure yeah, out their wellness. I mean uh, a patient can buy we had one patient who got such good results. She was a physical therapist but she bought her own laser and she does her own laser therapy at home now. Uh what the wavelength is. Um, I think for the infrared it's like eight oh three and I think for the red it's like five thirty five. I could be wrong, but it is important to have a laser that has a beneficial wavelength. And so when you buy cheaper lasers, that they're just, there's a lot of drift because it takes a lot of technology to hold light at a specific wavelength. And so the laser we bought was about 6,000. Mm -hmm. So you bought it three years ago before COVID, so it was getting patient at that time. Oh, as a rheumatology practice, joint pain. The other thing that we get amazing results with is skin conditions, like wounds. Like say you have an older person who comes in with, you know, they bump their leg, they get a huge gash, you can't suture it, and they just, rather than go to the wound clinic for two months, we can laser it, and within a couple of weeks, it's dramatically better. Um, shingles, you know, we've had people come in with horrible shingles on their head, and um, the laser's really good, and even wounds. Like I'm lasering this man now who, he was in a very bad car accident five years ago. He has a huge scar, like from, you know, shin to up to the top of his tibia, probably about this thick. He's had no feeling in his foot for five years. And after doing about a month of lasering on him twice a week, he's beginning to get sensation back mm -hmm. in his foot. So um, by reducing, I think, the scar and the interference field that that scar causes in the body, um, you know, we're just seeing really amazing results. What about psoriasis? Psoriasis is tougher. Eczema is easier. For, for if, and, you know, psoriasis, if people aren't working on their gut, if they're not changing their diet, if they're not doing other things, Psoriasis, I have not gotten as good results with, with the cold laser, especially if they're kind of down the line with it. They've had it for a long time. They're on biologics. It's been a chronic thing. So I wouldn't give up on it, but I haven't had as good results with psoriasis. I like a question for Mark. Uh, in one of your talks somewhere, you were mentioning about the app. Was the app? <laughs> I'm sorry. An app. An app? Yes. How did you, how far did you get? Oh, from, not tonight, you mean. 
put something I did yeah. somewhere else. Yeah, uh, yeah, but so I, I, um, I was um, connected by um, the guy who does our website. He's actually in Pakistan. Connected me to a guy who's in Serbia, and um, so I said, like, I, I need, I need this, I need a program because it's too much time and effort work to like input everybody's data. I got pulled everybody's lab up there, you know, all these like you know, multiple pieces of data. So, so yeah, we were started working on an app, um, you know, really just for um, personal slash, um, you know, for the uh, college usage, um, but. Yeah, so there, so it's um it's in process. Um, he's, he has a um, he has a beta version. It just isn't um you know it's not really pretty usage. So yeah, for me it's really I mean you know ultimately so what I one thing I maybe failed to say was I was just looking on my phone because I was I, on the way here I was texting my wife asking because she's you know she's in Spain on this conference but the 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 premier metabolics researcher in the world is in Australia. His name is Jeremy Nicholson. He used to be from the UK. Um, Queen's College, I think it was, you know, premier school and uh, university there, and then he got offered like multiple, multiple billions of dollars to open this program in Australia. And um, the guy is apparently just like a genius type guy, right, a savant type. And so she said, um, they have a metabolome, they have a metabolomics profile on blood testing where they have high, high, high confidence of being able to predict who's going to have long COVID. Um, you know, and so that's the kind of also, but but ultimately, the point here is that what they do in research with metabolomics is basically how I think of. I mean, it's just kind of met this way, right? This is that's that's how I think about this, this framework. They they basically the way I think of it is like they take blood samples and just measures everything they can measure, and then they take computer algorithms and say, okay, what are the connections? What sticks statistically to whatever you know degree, et cetera. And they come up with these incredible, incredible connections, right? I mean, they've got, you know, she told me there was a paper as an example. I tell this patient a lot. Um, I don't have the details right. I asked her recently to re refresh me on the details, and she was like, eh, I don't think those are quite right, but it's something along the lines of this. 17 to 23-year-old boys from a specific province in Mexico. I think she said actually, actually it was India, not Mexico. But um, if they have a specific genetic defect, and they have vitamin D deficiency, and they are exposed to some particular environmental trigger, I just don't remember what it is, it triggers on rapid obesity. And you can't turn it around unless you at least know and treat the, the low vitamin D first, or somewhere in the early sequence. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of, to me, that's the kind of like, for me, if we have like a, if I have a framework, and I can start, you know, I or people as a community, we can like start collecting data going, you know, because all the data we have, right, the, 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 the paradox with randomized controls trials, I'm not paradox, but the downside is it's so reduced, right, but that's just not life. So you have to, going in the world of metabolomics is more what it's about, where it, it takes, I mean, they're using crazy computers that sometimes are more advanced than what the government uses, you know, that's what she tells me. And, um, and so can we collectively by observation and you know transparency of like when you say oh this looks like it works this looks like it works well i always want to know like are we talking about you've seen that three patients have you seen that in six have you seen that in ten are we talking about 50 you know if we can like collectively start looking at some observation of data and all of a sudden hey um we can start looking at patterns right that's what medicine's about and so with this app i'm not saying that uh, you know how i think about things is data-based or um truth or anything. I've just, for me, created some kind of framework to say, hey, as I start collecting more um, observations and data, and if other people are doing the same, then maybe we can advance the clinical side of medicine, you know, a little faster, more in parallel to what they're doing in the metabolomics research side, because we know that's going to be past our lifetime before what they're doing there translates into clinical medicine, you know? So, um, I, your question was on the app. Yeah, it's, uh, it, yeah, I, I can, if people are interested, I can let people know um, when that eventually happens. But ultimately, the purpose of the app is not that it's giving us truth answers, it's to start, make some better decisions and start collecting data so we can just make even better decisions later on. It's eight o'clock now, so I think we want to wrap up. People are welcome to stay and talk with one another and ask each other questions. Yeah, no, that's great. I think it was a, a great talk. Thank you, Dr. Sue. Um,
uh, hopefully next time we do a meeting, we'll have it be in person in person for uh, everyone. It will make it a lot easier for the people on the Zoom to hear as well. Uh, How many people are online? Uh, I think we had 20. We something. had 20 online. Uh, and there was other uh, great questions on the chat. Uh, I think a lot of them people went over. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I, I think it was a great presentation. I think the group is, is uh, it's a great group. So thanks again for all the sponsors uh, for everything that they do. Uh, and uh, we'll hope to see you soon. Thank you. Uh, feel free if you want to read through any of the ones that are in the chat. This meeting is adjourned. No, I, I use it um, for the front of the so, yeah, I'm not going to